So um, I focused on grading the lab this weekend because I wanted to give you guys feedback um, on the lab before. Professor? Yes. It looks like your camera's kind of got accepted in the top half. Obstructed by something. Oh, I'm using the wrong camera. Hold on a second. Thank you. I can't see the window because I have too many windows open. Um, yeah, that's the wrong camera. Okay. There you go. All right. Sorry. Um, so I graded the lab. I mean, most people did a pretty good job on the lab uh, in terms of collecting the data and analyzing it. So there were small things, and I sent you guys an email regarding it. Um, and those, those usually are ongoing items like sig fig errors and things like that, but I thought I'd point them out. Um, but like I said, overall, I think people did a pretty good job. I think out of the three semesters in which I've done the lab, this is probably the best uh, set of uh, DC circuit analysis labs, so that's good. Um, the lab is set up this week. Will be open Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So I want to see you come in here. Um, I need this. I, I need you to see you in here to make to know that you know. So I know that you actually collect the data. Okay. So everybody who's in the group has to be here. Okay. Um, either Tyler and I will uh, note that you're here. So when we see you. Okay. So just just make sure you let us know uh, you are here when you collect the data. Okay. And and if you need to take the data Monday. Uh, next Monday, that's fine. I mean, the last two, the, the last two in-person labs, uh, same equipment. So, and then the motor lab, I had a person come in and try the motor, uh, or two people come in and try the motor, and um, using our power supply makes so much of a difference compared to the batteries. Um, the batteries cannot provide enough current, so it's possible your motor might be working. Uh, but the batteries are not supplying enough current for you uh, to really see if it, if it works. So uh, if you have time also to try your motor, please do so because um, using our power supply here makes a big difference. I will try to grade your exam by Wednesday. Uh, that's my goal. So um, the problems are shorter. They're not, too, uh, not super involved, so I'm hoping I can, I can whip through them quickly. We'll see. And if the, if the class did well, then I should, I should get done quick, okay? Um, I did, at the last minute, just before, just before class, I changed the uh, deadlines of the homework assignments. Because um, someone rem reminded me the other day that the Chapter 32 homework was due tonight, which is not fair. So um, I have it due next Monday, okay? Thank you. All right, so uh, I know it's over the holiday, but we have, the, we have two more homework assignments after that. One of them is long, and the other one's very short. The, the homework assignment in the last chapter is very short. And a lot of the problems in the last homework assignment are plug and chug. Okay. But the chapter 33 homework has a lot of problems in it, so um, I give you a little bit. I needed, we needed to get this out of the way so that you can do chapter 33 homework. Okay, because that's the, that's the bulk, the meat of this last unit. All right, um, so my goal today, and I forgot to erase this, are to um, do RL circuits and talk about mutual inductance. And then lastly, if we get to it, um, LC circuits. And I hope to get to this so that Wednesday I can just do a start on AC circuits in chapter 33. That'll give me quite a bit of time to go through that chapter if I can do that. Okay, so I introduced on Monday the concept of self-induction. So when you have a coil of wire and you run a time varying current in the coil that's going to it's going to induce 
on the EMF because there's a flux changing through itself and that's going to oppose any changing current in the circuit and this ends up being this coil also kind of an inductor is the last linear circuit element that we're covering in this course and we talked about the inductance that the inductance we can calculate geometrically from uh, the number of turns this coil has times the flux through it divided by the current through it and in many cases this is hard to calculate it's just tough to set up the to, to actually do the integral and this is tabulated you can look it up and you know you can look up inductance for various geometries in an engineering book I'm sure you can find them online okay you should know how to do the real simple ones like the uh, um, solenoid and the toroid those are pretty easy ones the toroid with the rectangular cross section not the circular ones Okay. A question about your formulas. Um, up there, you have inductance is equal to that, which is equal to an expression that is, is that supposed to be induced EMF on the right? This is the induced EMF. Uh, oops, that's, that's right. Okay. I don't know what I was thinking there. Thank you. Okay. Where delta V is the induced EMF. Okay. So this, this is determined, you know, experimentally because you can measure the induced EMF and you can measure the IDT. But, you know, you're not going to be able to measure the IDT directly with a scope. But you can measure DVDT with a scope across a resistor and then divide the DVDT by the resistance and you have the IDT. Okay, because with, a, with a, a oscilloscope, you can't measure current, you can measure only voltage. But if you take DIDT to a DVDT and divide by R, then you can get DIDT. So this is measured on a scope. And you're going to do that, you're going to learn how to measure slopes from the scope this week okay so that's how one would do this experimentally so this would be an experimental way to determine it and this would be the geometric way or the theoretical way okay what we want to do is look at what happens when you put an inductor in a circuit and I'm my analysis here is going to assume that the inductor is um, ideal we're going to assume that the resistance of the inductor is small compared to the resistance of the, the circuit. So I want to look at what's called oops, an RL circuit. So I have a um, power supply. I'll have a resistor and an inductor. I'll put a switch here. And I'm going to close the switch and see how the circuit responds. All I have to do is apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. So if I close the switch, then I have a current shown. If you sum the, the voltages in the direction of the current, then the voltage drop across the inductor is minus LDIDT. So you can just say, oh, um, let me just sum the, I'm going to have the current like this, and I can sum the voltage drops in my loop. As long as I, I go in the direction of the current, then I can, I can just say, um, I can just go this way and say, okay, well, delta V minus IR minus L DI 
over dt equals 0. Otherwise, I can do the following. I can say, okay, well, I have, um, I can just sum my, I can just take this integral. I can, I can set up this integral. And this is going to be uh, my D, L D I D T, and then this is going to be I R minus delta V. I got to choose a direction for the electric field to do this. Okay. Based on the norm, based on the direction of the, of the uh, magnetic field. So I can do the problem either way. Okay, this is more technically sound, but it's more complicated. However, if I just say I'm going to sum the currents, I'm going to sum the voltages in the direction of the current, I can always write my voltage drop due to the inductors minus L D I D T. So what do you do with this now? What kind of math I'm not good at yet. You what? Is it, that's a differential equation. Yeah, this, is a, this right? is a differential equation, and this is separable. So you can separate variables. And you remember, I did that for the RC circuit. And I've, I've done several kinds of these problems where I've separated var variables and integrated. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to give you the answer. Okay. If you, if you actually go ahead and solve it, you get that the current in your circuit is the power supply voltage over R times 1 minus E to the minus R T over L. And you see that what happens is the current, if you plot the current as a function of time, instead of doing this is what most people expect, it does this. And asymptotically approaches the maximum value. And again, I'm assuming that the resistance of the inductor is zero. It's not, okay? If you're doing an experiment and you wanted to test theory, your theory with the experiment, is, this is what we're doing in the lab, you do want to measure the resistance of the inductor, especially if it's significant, okay? So we can rewrite this R over L. We can define... L over R as tau, and we'll call it a time constant. And so we can write, rewrite this equation in the following way. Okay, and we did something like that for the capacitor. We define a time constant. This has units of time because this is a volt amp. Right, this is a, a volt amp second, and then and then this is uh, ohms, volt amp seconds. Yes, yeah, so this is basically ohm second, and then this is ohms. So the so the ohms cancel, leaving you with seconds. And so this is the rate at which current builds in the circuit. I don't want to say charging because we're not talking about a capacitor. Okay, so this is where the rate at which, this is the way, the way in which the current builds in your circuit. And the voltage drop across the resistor is just this thing times R. So delta V sub R is 
this times the resistance. Now, how do I get the voltage drop across the inductor? Well, I can use LDIDT if I wanted to. Or I can use Kirchhoff's voltage law because I know that the sum of these two voltage drops has to be equal to that. Okay, and what you'll get is that. Okay, so once you know this, don't expect me to put a, a, an equation sheet on the equation sheet, uh, this expression or that expression. You should know how to figure that out because you know that you know Ohm's law and you know Kirchhoff's voltage law, you should be able to easily figure those out. Questions? Uh, uh, kind of. This is kind of just like exams in general. We only, we only have one left, but um, if we were to use either one of those equations, would you want us to derive them first, like from that bottom equation? You mean what, these? Yeah. yeah. Well, that one's would easy. I mean, it's almost pretty obvious because... You can just say, well, I times R, yeah. and you get that. I mean, that's all you need to say, right? Okay. And, and then this is, is straightforward, because all I got to do is take this, subtract that, and I get this term. So, I mean, you can almost, you literally can write this down, right, if you know this. Okay, yeah, that was my question. Yeah, you can literally write it down, but... You might want to derive this one, either by taking DIDT. I mean, I might ask in a test, derive the equation for V sub L. Let's okay. say, I, let's say I, I tell you, then, then you have to derive it. But it's, that's easy. You can either do it this way or this way. You okay. can either subtract two numbers or you can take a derivative. Okay. And then I had a quick question. That equation we have down at the bottom, does that only describe an increase in current or does it work for decreasing as well? These expressions? Yeah. It works for in any case. Okay. All right, because this is in general, right? Yeah. This comes from solving this expression in general, whether the, the current is increasing or decreasing. Thank you. So what is the current after one time constant? In other words, when t equals tau, then after one time constant, and then I write i is delta V sub, uh, sub S over R times 1 minus E to the minus 1. E to the minus 1 is 0.37. 1 minus 0.37 is 0.63. So after one time constant, you have 63% of your maximum current. Your maximum current is basically this. So how does the inductor behave? How does the inductor behave after a long time period? Uh, like a wire? Yes, it, it behaves just like a wire. Okay, an ideal, uh, an ideal one, right? A real one would act like a resistor, right? 
But an ideal one, one, if you wait a long time, this acts like a wire. At t equals zero, this thing wants to maintain the current. But at t equals infinity, it just acts like a wire. So there's no voltage drop across it at t equals infinity, uh, assuming the ideal case, right? If, if it's not ideal, then it acts like a resistor. You should understand when, you know, how resistors, I mean, how capacitors and inductors behave at extreme cases. So let's take a look at this expression. I have too much stuff here, I have to erase the board. And I'm going to separate it out. So I'm going, to, I'm going to distribute. This has two terms to it. This is called a steady state term, and this is called a transient. This is how the, this is basically represents the response of the circuit when you close the switch. This thing dies out if you wait long enough. And this is what, what you end up with at the end. Okay. So the transient means it's temporary. Steady state is the part that you get when this stops responding, when this thing goes to zero. Okay, again, I, I want to use those terms because I want you to get used to using those terms. You'll, you'll see it in, in engineering courses. Okay, so t equals infinity, your current is delta V sub S over R. So how does the, how does an RL circuit affect a signal that's a square pulse? So I have one set up, and in, in this particular case, I'm looking at, I'm going to be looking at the voltage across the inductor. And you're going to see why I'm having you do the experiment by measuring the voltage across the resistor. Okay, so I have an RL circuit. Let me point the camera down. There's my R, there's my L. This is basically the circuit you're going to be using in the lab. And let's turn this on. I'm not plugged in. And I'm going to put a square pulse in. Okay, so let's just take a look at channel one. That's the voltage. Can you guys see that? Maybe I should, I should zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so that's channel one. This is channel two. Notice how sharp that is. Imagine trying to measure uh, the time it takes for the voltage to go to one half its maximum value. It's a very sharp change. And so uh, this is why uh, I'm having you look at the voltage across the resistor. Because when you look at the voltage across the resistor, it'll look like the, um, the voltage across the capacitor in part one of the lab. It'll make it much easier for you to make the measurements because, I mean, this is very difficult even if I, if I stretch the signal. It's very hard to see that. Okay? So let me show you both channels at the same time. You, the, only places you see a the only place you see a transition is when the voltage changes. You guys see that? Let me see if I can make it brighter. 
Oh, it is, it's, it's at the brightest. Can you guys see these transitions? It's right faint. Here. It's very faint, right here, yeah. right here. That's you can what, see it a little better when we were zoomed in one more notch. When your when your time um, scale like that was zoomed, yeah, it's a little easier to see there. Okay, so you can see that. So basically, it's when the voltage from the power supply changes, you see a, a spike. So all you see is spikes when you look at the voltage across the inductor because it depends on DIDT, right? It's, if you have a spike here, you're gonna have a spike. If you, if you have an abrupt change here, you're gonna have a spike in the voltage across the inductor, okay? When you do the lab, you're gonna be looking at the voltage across the resistor, it's a much smoother transition. And if I change the frequency, oops, that's too slow with change. You can see it takes longer. It looks like it takes longer because I'm increasing the frequency and I'm giving the circuit less time to respond to the given value of L and R. Right, the time constant staying the same. I make, I'm, I'm increasing the frequency, so I'm giving it less time for the current to build. And notice that the current doesn't reach, the voltage doesn't reach the maximum value. Can you guys see that? The maximum voltage is right up to here. Because I'm not giving the circuit enough time for the current to build up. And as I keep going, that peak will get smaller. But then you can also see that it's taking longer for the current to build up. Do you guys see that? If I set the... If I set the... Um, Um, the frequency to 100 hertz, you would just see spikes. I have this set to 39,000 hertz. So let me go back to 1,000 hertz. And let's go back to what we had. I'm going to change uh, the inductance. I made the induct. I, w I went from 5 milli Henry to 1 Henry. Notice how much how much slower it responds. Because the time I made the time constant huge. So this is one Henry, this is five milli Henrys. Just by I mean I changed the time constant by quite a bit, and you see it's a huge difference. Questions on that? Okay. So let's go back. Not sure why one side of the board is always blurry. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that inductor store energy. I'm going to write the expressions. Well, let me write Kirchhoff's laws. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change things around. I'm gonna apply Kirchhoff's law to the RL circuit again. And I'm gonna put these two terms on the other side. This is the expression you would get if you applied Faraday's law. I'm going to multiply through by the current.
Oops. Okay. Now what? This is a conservation of energy equation because it's, it's, I'm relating power. Okay? I'm looking at the power in the circuit. So it's just an expression of conservation of energy. What is this last term? This is the energy that's lost by the system. This is the work that's done by the power supply. They're not equal to each other. So some energy has to be stored. This is the energy that's stored. Okay, this is the work done by the power supply by the external source. Some of it's lost, some it's stored in the circuit in, this, in the field. And so then, we can say then that du sub b over dt is equal to L times I di over dt. Let's cancel out the dt's. And then I'm going to integrate both sides. And then I'm going to make my constant of integration zero, because when the current's zero, I have no energy stored. And this is the energy stored in an inductor. Now, wait a minute. How can you? How can a? How can? An, how can a magnetic field store energy? Because magnetic fields don't do work on charges. Do you see a problem with that? Right, magnetic fields don't do work on charges. So how does a magnetic field store energy? Because that means that when it releases its energy, it does work on particles. How is that possible? What do you think? Does that have something to do with, oh man, what happens? Is it an electric field is induced when the uh, magnetic field changes? Is that why we're... Yeah, that's absolutely similar? correct. It's the electric field that's induced that does the work. That's absolutely correct. So when I changes, you have a changing magnetic field that induces an electric field. It's the electric field that's doing the work. Okay, but it's always confusing when you look at that. It's like, wait, how can the magnetic field store energy? Because it can't. But it, but it can in this case because B changes with time, and that induces an electric field. And that field does the work. Okay. And so it's a simple expression. The energy stored by the field is one-half Li squared. All right, I mean, we had it for the capacitor, right? For the capacitor is one half C V squared or C delta V squared. For the capacitor, there was multiple ways to write it. For, for the inductor is basically this way. Does that represent the instantaneous? Yeah, this is the instantaneous. Is okay. Yeah, because I haven't written I as a function of time. That's a good question. This represents how much current, uh, I mean I'm sorry, how much energy is stored at whatever time that's uh, whatever instant in time you want you want to use and then when uh, the system reaches steady state the energy will just stay there now when when, when the system reaches steady state then the, the current doesn't change. It's like having the ball at the bottom of a hill. Right? When, the, when the ball is at the bottom of a hill, it's not going to do anything. 
Okay, so what can we do with this equation? Let's look at the solenoid. Well, what is L for a solenoid? Okay. L is mu n squared A times the length. Remember that the magnetic field B is mu naught, this is mu naught, sorry, n times, I remember n is the number of turns per unit length in this thing. So the energy that would be stored in a solenoid carrying current I is mu naught n squared A times L times I. This L is the length. Well, let me write, let me write the L differently, sorry. This L is the length, okay. There's too many capital L's, that, that was bad. Okay, so, what is eight times L? Radius. Mm. But it's the, it's the cross-sectional area times the length of the solenoid. What is that it's represent? The okay. It's a volume, right? Okay, so, so this is a volume. Oh, I forgot, I forgot the, this is I squared. I forgot the two, sorry. Okay, so this is a volume. Um, what is the magnetic field mu naught n times i? So isn't this, I want to compare this to this. Um, Isn't this b squared over 2 mu naught? This term. Isn't this b squared over 2 mu naught? Are we missing an extra mu naught for, for it to be b squared? Yeah, I, put, I took out a mu naught here. Okay. Oh, this is a volume. So u sub b is this thing, which is b squared over 2 mu naught times the volume. And I'm going to do something similar as what I did to the electric field. I'm going to define the energy per unit volume, u sub b. Little u sub b is equal to big U sub B over V, and we call it the energy per unit volume. And granted, I did it for the solenoid, but if you use vector calculus, you can define this in general. You can define the energy per unit volume, or, or I'm sorry, you can derive the expression for the energy per unit volume as given by this expression. Which means that if B varies, if B varies, then
you're going to write the total energy stored as the integral of the energy density times dv. And if you can carry out the integral, then you have another way to solve for L. Sometimes finding L might be easier by actually carrying out this integral and solving for L. I'm not going to do an example here, but we did one for the capacitor. Because um, when we did it for the capacitor, we did this for the capacitor. And this is the volume. And, and we did an example with a sphere we saw for C. You can do the same thing for an inductor. And, and this gives you another way to calculate L, um, where just doing the integral of the flux might, might be a tough thing to do. Let's take a look at this next circuit. Okay, so after I, I close S1, the current builds, and S2 is open by the way, current builds, energy stored in the inductor. I then open S1 and close S2. What happens? That opening and closing happens at the same instant? Yes, let's, let's pretend we can do that. You can do that with switches. You can rig up a switching system that way. Okay, so I close this, current builds, so now I have total current I, then I open this and at the same time I close this. Now this has energy stored in it, but we take, when we open S1, we take the power supply out of the circuit and this has energy stored in it, and it's got to give up that energy. It gives it up to the resistor, and then current goes through this loop right here. And from the loop rule, and I made them both positive because di dt we know is going to be negative. We can determine the direction of that current. Yeah, let, let's say let's say the um, the way I have the battery was strange. So the current was going like this, right? Yeah. Initially, when you close this switch and open this switch, the inductor wants to maintain that current, and so the current will, will still be going okay. clockwise in this loop. I'm sorry, counterclockwise. That makes sense. This thing does not want yeah. this. It wants to maintain the direction of the current. Well, it wants to maintain the current, and so it's going to keep going this way, but it's going to die down because of that resistor. Because the resistor is going to be sucking the energy from it. But and we can solve for v as, uh, i as a function of time. Again, it's a differential equation. This is a very easy one to solve, but I'm not going to solve it for you. I was going to tell, give you the final result just in the interest of time. And you get that the current that decays is I naught e to the minus r t over L, where your r here is the r that's in this loop. And one of the things students forget, and I noticed it happened on the exam, 
on when we did the capacitor. The R is going to be the R of the loop in which the current decays. So you might have a resistor here and a resistor here, but once you open this switch, you take that resistor out of the circuit. And so the R is the, the R in your loop in which the current is decaying. Okay, and this is the current you started with when you open the switch. Okay, now, you know, students might ask, well, how do I know which equation do I use? How do I know which you want to choose from? Well, if, if the current's building, then you use this. If the current's decaying, you use that. That's how you remember them. As t goes to infinity, the current will go to zero. That means it's decaying. As t goes to, in, to uh, I'm sorry, as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. As t goes to infinity, this goes to your maximum current. Okay? Think of the physics. Then you can figure out which equation to use. Okay? Now, what happens in the energy to, in the circuit in this case? Well, it all goes to the resistor. Okay? The energy, the rate at which energy is lost by the resistor. is I squared R. So if I is given by this expression, then I'll write I want to know how much energy is lost by the resistor once the current's gone. So I'm going to integrate this from what to what? What are my limits of integration? I want to find a total energy lost by the resistor. And I want to show that all the energy came from the inductor. When I integrate this, I'm going to get a one half L over R I'll get a minus sign out here too The term at infinity is zero and then the term at zero is one One of the R's cancel And all the energy that was lost by the resistor came from the inductor. Because this is the energy the inductor had when you started. When you open the switch S1 and close S2. Okay. Whatever energy was stored in the inductor is all taken by the resistor. Let's do an example. In fact, I got this example. I, I think when you look at the practice exam for this unit, um, 
I decided to use that, that example. So this is actually on one of the, the practice exam. And you'll see a homework problem related to it, but it's longer than this one. So let me draw the circuit for this. I have a power supply, which is 20 volts. I have a 90 ohm resistor. This is point B. This is point A. And then I have a 40 ohm resistor. And a 5 Henry inductor, which that's a big inductor. Okay. So we let the current build. What's the potential difference between A and B? Just before I open a switch. So I let, I let the current build. Actually, what's the potential difference between A and B at any time? It should just be 20. It's always 20, right? So this is at 20, that's a, let's say this is at 20, that's at zero volts. Okay. So the potential difference between these two points, the magnitude is 20. Okay, if I want to do it exactly, this, this is at zero, this is at 20, okay. What is the current through the 90 ohm resistor? It's always the same thing because I just have a resistor and it always has 20 volts across it. It has 222 milliamps. Um, what is I-40 when S1 is closed for a long time? Or after? Are we assuming it's an ideal? Yes. Um, and once you just do it the same way? So it'd be 20 volts or 40 ohms, right? Yeah. And I total is 722 milliamps, correct? Now comes the fun part. Let's open a switch. Oh, yeah, and, and the current's going before I open a switch. Hold on a second. Current's going this way here, and the current's going this way here, correct? These black arrows, maybe let me make them red. When I open the switch, what happens to this current? Well, we gotta be careful because when I open the switch, this guy doesn't want the current to change. 
the total current or the current it's experiencing? Well, the total current is, is going to be different because the battery's taken out, right? Once I open this. Yeah. And so I just have this loop. The current through this resistor is going to be governed by this loop only. And it's going to be, at, at, when I open the switch, the, the, the current's going to be this value. The current through either one of these resistors. Now, would that direction change if, say, the top resistor was much smaller and, and like, say, was like a full amp across it? No, th because this thing wants to maintain the current. Okay. Right? As long as it's not, I mean, as long as this, this inductor dominates, the current will, this thing is going to want to push the current like so, counterclockwise. It wants to keep the direction it had. Okay. In fact, it wants the 500 milliamps. At t equals zero, just when you open the switch, the current will still be 500 milliamps. Okay. Okay, so when switch is open, because remember, this, this resist changes oppositions, right? This opposes changes in current. So when the switch is open, Inductor maintains five hundred milliamps at least for the time being. Well, now what's the voltage drop across this? What's 90 times a half? <laughs> 45. 45. So now there's 45 volts. In fact, if this is at zero volts, this is at minus 45 volts. It went from 20 to 45. Let me check my notes. It seems like I did something wrong on my notes. What's the voltage drop across this one? Twenty. Twenty. So you go down twenty you go so you go down forty five and then down another twenty volts. And so what's the voltage drop across the inductor? You go down 45 and then go down another 20. What must the voltage drop across this thing be? 65. 65. So this is zero. This points at minus 45. This points at minus 65. And that's zero. And so the voltage increases by 65 volts. And energy is still conserved, even though the voltage here is higher than when I started. The total energy is conserved. Because remember, this is how much current I had in the circuit before, right? There's a homework problem where um, it's similar to this where you close a switch and the voltage across one of the resistors is huge because the resistor the resistance is very large okay you'll see this this is ex almost exactly like one of the homework problems okay it's one of the ways you can produce a very large voltage okay questions on this one because this one's always puzzling 
But energy is conserved. If you actually go through and, and look at the energy you had before and the energy you have afterward, you're okay. Okay. So let's take a look at, we've talked about self-inductance, but there's another topic we want to look at is, um, let me get two coils out. And we did talk about this in chapter 31. Let's say I have two coils. Okay? And I hook this coil up to a power supply. And I hook this one to a, an ammeter. And let's say this one is hooked up to a time varying power supply. This is going to detect the current. And you know, from Faraday's law, you're going to get a current through here if the, if the current through the, the first solenoid changes. So we want to look at how the two circuits affect each other. And you could do something like this with capacitance, but we normally don't. Not in this course. Okay, so let's say I have coil one, has a bunch of turns. And it's producing a magnetic field that varies with time. And I have a second coil I put near it, so you have field lines passing through coil two. Coil one has turns N1 and current I1. And coil two may or may not have current. I mean, coil two may have a current in it due to this guy. Okay. So what is this coil experiencing? Well, it's experiencing a time varying magnetic field. For coil two. Okay. For each turn, the flux through this thing is going to be proportional to the current. And some geometrical factors due to uh, the system. Okay. So the flux through 2 due to 1 is going to depend on the current in coil 1 times some geometric stuff okay in case some proportionality concept that depends on geometry you remember the magnetic field due to this coil depends on the current and its geometry the, the geometry of the coil but also the, the number of field lines passing through here Depends on the geometry of this coil. So this has some geometrical factors built into it, whatever they are. Okay? 
It involves the geometry of the first coil and the geometry of the second coil. Does that make sense? And we're looking at just one of the turns and coil two. If you want to look at all the turns, so the flux through this coil depends on the number of the total flux through the, all these coils depends on how many turns this thing has and then the, some geometrical factors that depend on coil one and coil two. And I'm going to give this a letter. I'm going to call M21 the mutual inductance of the system. Now, in fact, d phi of 2, 1 over dt is going to be the induced EMF and coil 2, or minus it, sorry. Which is going to be equal to minus has same kind of format as the self-inductance. So this represents how one coil affects the other. And as a result, we can solve for M21, right? M21 is going to be N2 times phi, 2, 1 over I1. And this gives us a geometric way to calculate the mutual inductance. So this is the geometrical way to calculate how one loop affects the other. And then experimentally, M2, 1 can be determined by the induced EMF in coil 2 divided by di1 dt. And we actually do an experiment when we're on ground. We actually do an experiment where we have a very long solenoid and we have a coil around it. And you guys measure it. And you make all the measurements with the scope. Okay. Now, you have to realize that if this current is changing and it induces a current here, guess what? That current's changing too, right? it will also induce a current in this coil. So, if I, if I write the induced EMF with the letter E, 
because it's easy to write. The induced EMF on one due to two So they induce the current on each other. Also, If you wanted to calculate the, the mutual inductance on 1 due to 2, then you'd have to calculate the flux of 1 due to 2. Now, using vector calculus, you can show how these two are related. How do you think they're, they're related? How they affect each other. This is the geometrical factor that relates how one circuit affects the other. How do you think they're related to each other? Anybody want to guess? They're equal. So the M's are, they, I mean, they, they, they represent how they affect each other, right? They have the same, they have the same geometry. So you would expect that they would have to have the same mutual inductance. Okay. The only thing that's going to be different is your eyes. If we wanted to study how a transformer works, because a transformer is basically two coils of wire wrapped around an iron core. And so in order to study how this works, we need to know the mutual inductance of the system in addition to the self-inductance of each coil. Calculating the mutual inductance of a system is not easy. Again, the integrals can be very difficult. We'll do an example that's easy, but in general they're hard. Same, since it's an inductance, the unit is going to be the Henry. So, oh, if I have this coil, what is the total induced EMF going to be in the coil? So let's say coil one has a time varying current. What's going to be the total induced EMF in this coil? Well, there's going to be an induced EMF due to that guy. What else is, going to, is there going to be? There's going to be another induced EMF due to what? The coils have a self-inductance. This coil has its own self-inductance. So the total voltage drop across this coil is going to be due to this circuit and due to its own self-inductance. When I was trying to do Faraday's law with the field coils, I was actually having trouble. Right, this is basically Faraday's law, right? So when I was doing Faraday's law with the field coils, I was actually having trouble showing you that the, the voltage is the derivative of the current 
because of this, this darn term was messing things up. The detector coil had its own inductance. And so in chapter 31, we were completely ignoring this effect. Just to keep the, the uh, analysis simple. So what's the total in induced EMF on the other coil? Oops. The total drop is going to be that due to the mutual inductance and then that due to the self-inductance. What if I have these coils, let's say I have two coils and I connect them in series. Then what? Suppose I connect the coils in series. Then I1 equals I2. Right? And so then I get for this coil, I think it ended up being the same. Um, well, we got to be careful because the L's might not be the same, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And the total voltage drop is going to be the sum of these two, right? If you have a circuit with two coils in, then the sum of the voltage drops is going to be is going to be the sum of these two. Now, this is the hard part in, when I add these two. These two are okay. I'm going to get But when I add these two, I got to be careful because it depends on how I have the current going through them. Because if the currents go in opposite directions, I have, I have two different issues. And so the second term so my effective inductance That's my effective inductance for the system. And that's going to that, that second term is going to depend on whether the currents are going in the same direction through each coil or in opposite directions. Okay? Look, the mutual inductance also depends on how these coils are oriented. Let's say I have the coils like this. What's the mutual inductance for the system? How many field lines are going to go through this coil? Zero. Zero. So the mutual inductance also depends on the orientation of the coils. Depends on, on the, how the current is going through the coils. Depends on the orientation, the geometry. It's actually complicated. Mm. I mean, if I have two coils like this, this is simple. Finding the mutual inductance of this is simple. Or if I have two coils wrapped on top of the other, finding the mutual inductance is simple. 
but that's usually not the case. Okay, a lot of times you have to use a computer to actually calculate the mutual inductance. Now, one thing I've ignored is if I have an iron core, if I have an iron core, this darn thing is heavy, in the coils, um, because you have something that's ferromagnetic, it gets more complicated. Okay. So we're not dealing with ferromagnetic materials here, but if you took a more advanced course, you will. I'm going to stop here. And so on Wednesday, I'm going to do a couple of examples, talk about the LC circuit, and then start an AC circuits. I would have kept going, but I have a meeting in a couple minutes. So um, I will see you guys on Wednesday, or I'll see you in lab. Okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right.